So, good evening and welcome to the third of the 2014 Darwin College lectures on the broad theme of plagues. And welcome to, to all of you here, wherever you've come from. And also welcome to the thousands of people around the world who watch these lectures afterwards. They're freely available to download from the web. Now, this is a very important year, as many of you will know, for, for Darwin College, as we celebrate the 50th anniversary as our founding as the first college in the university exclusively for graduate students and the first mixed college. From a very small beginning, we are now amongst the largest college with an alumni body encompassing every subject and spread right around the world. Now tonight, I'm very pleased indeed to welcome our lecturer, Mika Hupanen, who will move our attention in this lecture series away from a biological look at plagues to the very significant threats from non-biological viruses and worms and the individual organizations and individuals behind all these cyber threats. Miko is the chief research officer of F-Secure in Finland and has been very active in the secu computer security industry for over 20 years. He's fought the biggest viruses in the net and his advice is sought around the world. PC World magazine list selected him as one of the 50 most important people on the web and in 2011 the Foreign Policy magazine identified him as one of the top 100 global thinkers. The internet has brought us amazing freedom to connect, communicate and share information. And our societies depend on the security of these IT systems. Our economies, our services, our transport systems and our businesses as well as our personal records are all potentially at risk from criminals who know no national boundaries. So I very warmly welcome Mika Hupinen to speak on Silicon Plagues. Thank you very much. Thank you for the kind introduction and thank you for inviting me to join this lecture series. My name indeed is Mikko Hyppönen and I've spent my whole career fighting viruses and Trojans and backdoors and most importantly fighting the people behind them. Because unlike all the other topics in this lecture series, the problems we're about to discuss are not natural. They are man-made. Computer plagues or worms or viruses don't just appear out of thin air. They're always manufactured and crafted and made by us human beings. We do use similar terms when we discuss computer viruses compared to real-world viruses. We might use terms like uh, replication or infections or parasitic infections or polymorphic viruses or metamorphic viruses or even retroviruses. But these terms aren't really meaning exactly the same thing as they do with biological plagues because these things always start from somebody's keyboard. There's always someone who decided that today I'm going to sit down and write some attack code. I'm going to write a backdoor. I'm going to write a Trojan. I'm going to write a worm. And these attacks have been with us for a very long time. The first academic studies on the idea of self-replicating code is already from the 1970s. But in my book, I really start counting the current problems starting from uh, 1986. Because 1986 brought us this. I have here a copy of the Brain.a computer virus. Brain.a was the first PC virus. It was found in 1986, and it slowly but surely replicated around the world. And because in 1986 we didn't really have the internet as we have it today, and we didn't have local area networks, we had no email or websites, the replication of worms which were spreading on floppy disks was very slow. People had to travel the world and carry these infected floppies with them. So, for example, for an 
infection-like brain to spread, let's say, from the United Kingdom to my home country, Finland, somebody would actually have to take a floppy and, and travel from UK to Finland and carry an infected floppy, floppy disk with them. Now, what makes brain interesting is that when we were analyzing this virus a long time ago, um, in the middle of all the code, we actually found some text. This here is the dump of an infected boot sector from an infected floppy. So you can basically see code in there. But if you look closer, there's also a text which says, somewhere in the middle, welcome to the dungeon, 1986, Basit and Amjad. And Basit and Amjad are names. They're Pakistani names. In fact, there's a street address, Nizam Blok Allama Iqbal Down, Lahore. Now, that's interesting. Now, this is from 1986, which means that two years ago was the 25th anniversary of the very first PC virus, this virus. And we had a meeting in our virus lab because we analyze viruses. We run labs in different parts of the world, and we spend our days looking at malware code. And we realized that it's going to be 25 years. So we had a meeting that, you know, we probably should do something about this. You know, it's going to be an important milestone. And our... Uh, Public relations people had an idea that we should start a social media campaign to raise the awareness of online security risks. And I thought that, that was boring. <laughs> so why don't I instead go to Pakistan and go to Lahore and go to that street address and see what's there today. So that's what I did. <laughs> this is the street. This is uh, uh, in Alama Iqbal Down in Lahore which is a very nice city, not really a holiday destination, but uh, uh, a very interesting place. And, and this here is the address. That's the door going into the building. And inside, well, would you believe, inside were both Mr. Bassett and Mr. Amja. <laughs> here on the left is Bassett. Sitting down is his brother Amjad. These guys who 25 years ago wrote the very first virus and left the address inside the virus code. They're still in the same address nowadays, running a small company, running a, a local internet operator, providing connectivity in the city of Lahore. And the name of this company is Brain Telecommunications. <laughs> they picked up the name from the virus, which then became, of course, very famous. And we had a very interesting discussion um, with Basit and Amjad about, like, did they really realize what they started 25 years ago? And, of course, they did. Um, they never meant any harm. These guys aren't criminals. They didn't really understand what they started. They really actually originally wanted to, 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 to showcase the problems, the security problems of the systems that were just becoming more and more popular, Microsoft-based systems, at the time, MS-DOS systems, which they thought were really insecure, so they made a demonstration. And their demonstration ended up spreading all over the world. And Basit and Amjad were especially um, unhappy about the fact that they themselves, since then, their own computers have been infected by various viruses over and over again. So they really hated viruses nowadays, when in fact they were the ones who started the whole problem. <laughs> so that's where we start from. Two guys, in the, at the time when they wrote the, the first virus, they were in their very early 20s. 25 years ago, they started something which since then has become a global, everyday problem. And we've seen massive, massive technological shifts in how malware works. Obviously, malware isn't spreading on floppy disks anymore. Nowadays, everything is on the Internet. When the Internet came around in the early 1990s, for most of us, that's when the malware problem really exploded, because suddenly the spreading speeds of malware skyrocketed. We started seeing outbreaks over email attachments and over, e uh, over web. Today, the most common way of getting infected on any of your devices would be by browsing the web and hitting a website which has been hacked and now contains exploit code which will jump from the web to your computer and infect it. So what I'll do is that I'll run down what really happened during these 25 years? How has the world of silicon plagues evolved from the very early days to where we are today? 
And you'll see that we haven't just gone through massive technological shifts in how malware works. The biggest shift has really been in who writes these viruses, who are behind these attacks, and what are their motives. That's where the biggest shift has really happened. So Brain wasn't, for a very long time, the only virus. It started getting copycats. People started modifying the code. Initially, all of them were um, similar in the sense that they only infected floppy disks, and you had to physically carry them around. But um, the most largest outbreaks that we ever saw um, were with the virus called Stone, and at least 200 different versions of this, these viruses. And these were all being done by hobbyists. They were just interested. They typically started by getting infected by themselves. So they had an infection on their computer, and they were wondering how it worked and how it, how it happened. And they look at the code, and they play around, and maybe at their own name there, maybe at some activation routines, or there's you know, something happening on screen on the infected machines. But then we started also seeing uh, developments where they were no longer creating viruses which were only infecting floppy disks. Cascade was the first virus which was actually widespread, and it wasn't spreading only on floppy disks because it actually infected files, program files. So if you were exchanging program files with other computers, no matter how you were doing the exchange, it would jump from one computer to another, slowly spreading across networks and eventually going global. Cascade and Yankee Doodle were the biggest problems of these what we call file infectors or parasitic infectors because you would have a clean file, for example, a game file, and that game would get infected. And you didn't know that it was infected because it still worked fine. The parasitic infection would actually make the file larger, add code to the original file. But then when, when you would take the game from your computer and transfer it to another computer, the infection spread. But I'll, I'll mention one of these file infectors in particular, because not because it would be historically important, because it isn't historically important. This one I mentioned because it's important to me. Omega virus was the first virus I ever analyzed. I was assigned by my boss at the time to take a look at this floppy which was sent to us by one of our customers, and they believe there's a new virus on it. And I was the young guy at the office. I was the only guy around the time who, who was uh, proficient in assembly language, so I had the skills of taking apart code. I had never done this on PC-based systems or MS-DOS-based systems, so it took me a long while, several days, to decode this virus, which wasn't very large at all. And it was cumbersome work because at the time, our operations were very simple. We, for example, didn't have a spare computer that I could infect and, and run the virus on it and see what happens. Uh, instead, I had to do all the reverse engineering on paper, pen and paper, and read through the code and figure out what I think it would do if it would really be run. And one of the routines in there called the MS-DOS interrupt number 10, and from the reference books, I could tell that that's the routine to display a character on screen. And the value it used to call that interrupt from ASCII charts, I could see that that was the value which would sim simplify the, uh, or uh, be the symbol for omega sign. So I named the virus omega. Then, two months later, we actually got a separate computer which we could infect and Rebuilt, So I actually infected it with the Omega virus. And I changed the date to Friday the 13th, which is when this virus would activate and do damage and show the symbol. And the symbol indeed was the Omega sign. So I got it right. I was really happy about that. And then we started a tradition with the company, which is that when you've been 10 years with our company, you get an Omega watch. <laughs> and I know what you're thinking. I should have named the virus Ferrari. <laughs> And that is my Omega watch. I'd love to show it to you. I'm not carrying it anymore. Nowadays, I have one of these geek watches, a Pebble, so which has an IP address and everything, which is neat. But, you know, I do have an Omega. Well, then we start getting into viruses which were sort of becoming famous. And some of the people in the audience will start remembering some of these outbreaks. For example, Michelangelo in uh, 1992 was front page news because it had a particular date on when it activated, and it was fairly widespread. And the date when it activated was the 6th of March. On 6th of March, if your system was infected with Michelangelo, it would overwrite all the files on your hard drive. In fact, it would overwrite the whole uh, system, including boot sectors and file allocation tables. Basically, you lose everything on your PC. And the name comes from the date. Michelangelo, the artist, was born on 6th of March. And this was one of the first... Um, um, 
malware hypes that we saw around the time, that everybody was expecting something spectacular to happen, and then when the date came around, nothing spectacular happened. Michelangelo did destroy computers around the world, but not millions of computers, not hundreds of thousands of computers, maybe a few thousand computers. Sort of similar build-up and then disappointment that we saw during the Y2K craze, when everybody was expecting something horrible to happen with computers, when the year turns into 2000, and nothing really happened. Some problems happened, but nothing spectacular. But the malware creators started getting more and more organized. Suddenly, it wasn't just isolated uh, solo artists writing viruses by themselves. They were starting to communicate over BBS systems and different networks and different chat systems, which were very rudimentary at the time. But we started seeing the emergence of gangs, malware writing gangs. And these were still hobbyists. They weren't trying to make money or anything like that, but they were working together typically young guys who would uh, uh, take it as a hobby of creating new viruses and sort of wanted to challenge us, play a game of cat and mouse with security companies like us, see how, how quickly we would find their viruses and, and make very complicated viruses which would be hard to detect. This, for example, created the problem of polymorphic viruses. Polymorphism in computer viruses means that the virus changes completely every single time it infects a new file. So the virus is capable of rebuilding its code completely together. The functionality stays the same. When you run the program, it does every single time. It does the same things. But the code looks completely different. So it's capable of decoding itself and repackaging itself so it changes appearance. And, and the only reason to do this is to make life harder for antivirus programs which try to detect known viruses, which we typically at the time were doing with patterns and search strings. If there's no constant pattern or search string, you can't detect it easily. This then led on to a race between virus writers and antivirus companies, which pretty much ended when antivirus companies started implementing full-blown emulators inside antivirus products, which is where we are today. Today, any antivirus that you would run on any of your systems would have a full-blown emulator in there, which basically would work so that if it is not capable of decoding a file, it will load the file to an emulator and run it. And the file will believe it's on a real computer, so it will execute itself. And when a polymorphic virus decodes itself, it basically opens itself up. So you can e trivially detect it after the decryption loop has ended. And these tools started becoming um, so easy to use that suddenly everybody could create viruses. It even led to a situation where you didn't have to be a programmer to be able to create new viruses. VCL, the Virus Creation Laboratory, is an example of this. It was created by a uh, malware writing group called Nuke, and it looks like this. So you have an interface. This is the time of MS-DOS, so it's an MS-DOS interface. But you have menus. You choose different functionalities. I want my virus to infect executables. I want it to, be, uh, uh, to do something on a specific date. And then you can configure what it does on that date. Maybe it shows a message. Maybe it does something destructive. And then you click a button which says generate. And it will create a new virus. Every time a different virus. And when this came around, we were really worried for a while. that you know, now there's going to be so many different viruses we can never keep up. But we were able to keep up. We, there, there's always ways of counteracting um, different advances we, uh, we've seen over the last 25 years or now 28 years, with PC viruses. But the MS-DOS systems were more and more getting replaced with this new operating system called Windows. Windows 3.1, major success story for Microsoft. It started getting very, becoming very common. Windows 3.11, Windows for workgroups, and then eventually Windows 95. And one thing that these operating systems brought with them were tools like Microsoft Office. Microsoft Word, Microsoft Excel, Microsoft PowerPoint. And inside these Office applications, there is a programming language. Macros and scripts that you could embed inside these documents, which initially weren't capable of doing much anything at all. But you could, for example, inside Excel have small programs which would, for example, modify cells when you modify one cell inside Excel. Well, it didn't take very long until malware writers realized that they can actually write simple viruses with these macro languages. And concept was the first example of this happening with Microsoft Word. And this was a major, major shift. 
because suddenly you weren't getting infected by bringing in infected floppies or exchanging programs. Now you got infected by exchanging documents. And if you think about that, well, that's what most of us do as our job, our daily, daily tasks, even today. That's what we do all the time. We create documents and we share them with other people. Here in university, I mean, most of you spend your big part of your day with a word processor or an spreadsheet tool or maybe with PowerPoint, and then you share it as email attachments over network shares or USB sticks. And if you imagine a case where just sharing a document to someone else could infect their system, well, that's basically what Concept did. And Concept became one of the largest outbreaks we had ever seen. It spread like wildfire. You would receive a document from somebody, you would open it, and your word would get infected. And from that moment on, every single, modify, every single document you modify or create is also infected, and the infection is invisible. So you keep sharing your new files and your modified files, and you will infect all the people you're in touch with or their computers. And that kind of spreading mechanisms, well, thankfully they don't work anymore, but this was a major headache for us for almost a decade. This eventually was killed off by newer versions of Microsoft Office, where Microsoft on purpose disabled some of the functionality they had built into the macro language inside Word and Excel and PowerPoint. So Microsoft actually killed this by restricting functionality in their own products. And it wasn't just Word viruses. A virus called Laru, which was an Excel virus, was an especially nasty case because some versions of, of this virus wouldn't just infect your spreadsheet files. They would actually modify the contents of your spreadsheet files. And the way they modified your, your spreadsheets wasn't destructive, like wiping everything. Instead, they modified them slightly. They would go through your spreadsheet, pick some random cells, and round them up or down. A little bit. <laughs> and we call these data diddlers because they s slowly but surely corrupt your data. And when this happens slowly and when the changes are fairly small, the problem is that you won't detect it until it's too late. So you keep working with the corrupted wrong data and you keep backing up the wrong corrupted data. It, it might take months. So for months you are working with more and more corrupted numbers in your spreadsheets until you finally realize that your numbers are wrong they're wrong because of a virus on your Excel system, and there's no records. You can't go back to yesterday's backups because they're corrupted as well. So major headaches. Data dealers were a big problem, and this is, thankfully, a problem which is now behind us. We don't see macroviruses anymore. And today, we wouldn't even have an attacker which would be interested in doing an attack like this. Because, you know, why would somebody create a virus which would do some random modification like this? Back then in, in uh, uh, 1996, somebody did this maybe as a fun joke, but they didn't really benefit themselves in any way. They were just causing harm to random unknown people they would never even see. And we don't really have attackers like that anymore. These old school hackers who were writing viruses for fun or for challenge, slowly they started to disappear. Then we started seeing viruses which were full-blown Windows malware, not just infecting documents, but actually infecting Windows systems themselves. Before this, it had mostly been a problem of the older MS-DOS-based, text-based systems. So, for example, the Marburg virus, which even steals its name from biological viruses, um, when it would infect your Windows system, it would wait a certain amount of days, and then it would show itself to the victims by changing the Windows desktop to show the marks of an infection. And many of the viruses at the time were doing exactly this. They would, wouldn't try to hide forever. They would let themselves be known. They would play music. They would show uh, some sort of effect on the screen. They would open and close the CD-ROM drive over and over again. So different kinds of ways of showing themselves or playing pranks with the user. And then in 1999, a virus called Happy 99 started spreading. And Happy 99 was a New Year greeting. You would get it from your friends in an email. People you knew, knew would send you an email which said, as a subject, Happy 99. And they would send an animation, which was basically a fireworks. When you click the attachment, you get a firework display on your screen. But while you're watching this firework display in the background, 
It's sending the same email to every single contact you have in your email address book. So now you would send the same happy 99 message to all of your friends. And they would open it because they know you and trust you. And now they would send it to all of their friends. And this became the first global email outbreak. And email outbreaks were a big problem because it builds on people's trust. You get an email from your brother. You get an email from your boss. You will open it. And you will open up the attachment. But it wasn't sent by your brother. And it wasn't sent by your boss. And now, because you opened up the attachment, you've already sent to all the people who trust you, who will open it because of the trust. The largest outbreak we saw after Happy 99 was a virus called Melissa. Um, And that was quickly then followed by the largest email outbreak in history, Love Letter. This was in 2000. And it used the best rules of all. You would get an email with uh, text which says that, please see the attached love letter from me. And then there was an attachment called I love you dot VBS. And the VBS means a visual basic script. So we would actually execute a script. And this went around the world, infected millions of computers in a matter of minutes. But email outbreaks have also died out. If you think about it, you don't really see email outbreaks much more anymore at all. Why is that? Well, because we had to strengthen our systems. And today, if you would try to send a VBS attachment, it would go nowhere. It would be filtered by firewalls and routers and different kind of blocking systems. Same thing with trying to send binaries or executables. They simply will not be allowed to go through. So the attackers have been forced to evolve into different kinds of attacks. And we saw that first with an attack called Code Red. Because Code Red wasn't spreading on floppies. It wasn't spreading on uh, program files. It wasn't spreading over email. This was a, an internet worm. An internet worm which wasn't trying to send itself as a file at all. Instead, it would scan IP addresses in the, in the whole internet, trying to find vulnerable servers, in this case, web servers, running Microsoft IIS uh, web server software, with a vulnerability in it. And when it fi- would find an infected or infectable web server, it would remotely upload its code and execute the code on the web server. And the code would restart the process. It would start scanning the whole internet for every single IP address. And there's 4 to 2 billion IP addresses in, in the IPv4 internet address space, which means there's less addresses than, than people on the planet. And some of these worms, like CodeRed, actually scan through every single of those addresses in 15 minutes. So they basically infected every infectable system within minutes from starting. Code Red did it in 24 hours. It wasn't as fast as some of the other worms which followed it. But this is the first 24 hours of the spread of Code Red. It pretty much finds every single server. Every, I mean, you could pretty much see where, do we, where in the world we have computers, or where we did have computers in 2001, and how it goes exponential. This is the spreading speed of Code Red. That's 20, the first 24 hours in the life of Code Red. And that got followed by very similar worms like Slapper, Slammer, Blaster, and Sasser. They all worked with the same idea of scanning for IP addresses, finding vulnerable servers or workstations, and infecting them. And some of these were indeed workstations, so normal Windows computers. They were trying to find remote protocols that they could access, protocols like LSASS or RPC. And this would typically be visible to the victim of the computer so that his computer would crash during the infection, because typically the exploitation would crash the process that's used to gain access on the computer. And this means that if you're running a machine, you would actually, at the time, see the infection with a message along these lines. This is what the Sasser worm would show to you. Excuse me, the blaster worm would show to you when when you get infected. So Windows tells you that it has encountered a critical error, and it gives you 60 seconds of time to save your work, and then it will reboot. Now, the problem is, when it reboots, you're still vulnerable. You still have the vulnerable RPC stack on your computer, which means that if there's lots of infections, another infected system will eventually find your IP address address again, and you will see this again. So this actually ended up in a situation that people were drastically trying to find a solution. So so how how do you close this hole? How do you prevent this rebooting from happening over and over again? Well... Somebody eventually told them that you you have to patch your system. And at the time, patching wasn't automatic. You actually had to go and download security patches manually with a web browser from Microsoft.com. 
So you would boot up your machine, you boot up your browser, you go to the internet at the time, you go to Microsoft.com, you find the right security update. It's right there. All right. So you click on the link, download. Here we go. You want to download this? Yes, I do. Let's put it over there. And then you start downloading it. But while you're downloading it, it was very typical that you actually get hit again. <laughs> and now you actually have two counters on your screen. One counting upwards, <laughs> one counting downwards. And this competition on which is going to win, whether you will be able to download the patch successfully or whether it's going to reboot, this game was being played on thousands and thousands of computers around the world. A very frustrating game, which in most cases probably ended up like it does here, that just barely it reboots. And then you try to do it faster the next time. Very, very frustrating. But it was actually much more than just a frustration. Worms like these for the first time, started to have real-world effects. They started to shut down things in the real world, not just computers, but things in our society. So we started seeing massive outbreaks, like this one from Slammer. This shows the outage chart, like how, how much packet loss do we have in the whole Internet. This is Saturday, um, the, tw uh, the 24th of January in 2003. And the... the um, Outage chart shows you the normal situation for the, the status of the internet. You know, there's packets being lost, but nothing very serious, 2 to 3%. This is normal. Then suddenly at 10.31 in the morning, it skyrockets to close to 20%, peaks above 20% of packet loss in the global internet. And this is unheard of. We've never seen anything like this. And this started affecting systems way beyond normal computers. So we started getting problem reports from factories, from plants, from different kinds of real-world systems. This is a screenshot I took at the time from Air Canada because their flights were grounded because they were infected with blaster. They were not flying their planes because their systems were down. And here's a screenshot from their check-in desk at the time. You'll see the blue screen right there in the background. Here's another screenshot. This is from CSX, one of the largest railroad operators at the time uh, in the United States. Their press release announces that they've been infected and the infection has resulted in slowdown of major applications, including dispatching and signaling systems. And as a result, all passenger and freight train traffic has been halted, including the morning commuter train service in the metropolitan Washington, D.C. area. Think about this. Trains around the capital of the United States of America, stop because of a computer virus. This actually happened 11 years ago. So I suppose the good news is that we don't really see such massive effects anymore. I mean, this is, would be, you know, front page news, of course, today as well, but we don't see cases like this. So it's, it's, it's a, an example on how we have been able to improve some of, some of our most critical systems. At least they are not getting infected by trivial attacks like Blaster and Slammer and Sasser anymore. So we are getting better. But so are the attackers. So after these internet worms, we found one email worm, which wasn't really remarkable in technical capability. But it stays in history books because it was the first computer virus we ever saw which was written to make money. Here, the motive no longer was to shut down systems randomly or cause damage or do it for fun. Fizzer was actually using the infected machines to reroute spam, Viagra email ads, which, of course, are being sent to make money. So this was when spammers, which were already a problem, started for the first time cooperating with virus riders. And this changed everything. Virus riders quickly realized that all these skills they had built were actually built, the skills they could sell. And the hobbyists quickly converted into professionals and started running different kinds of professional malware gangs. And this is a problem that we are still fighting today. Some examples of malware writers who have been caught over the years or online criminals. This is Alfred Gonzalez, photographed in his uh, penthouse suite at the Peninsula New York Hotel. He was 22 at the time when this photo was taken. And it's actually very nice to stay in expensive hotels when you're 22 if you're not paying the hotel bills with your own credit card, but with someone else's credit card. Because credit card theft with malware quickly became one of the money-making mechanisms. 
You infect people's computers, then you put in a keylogger which records as people do online purchases. And they pay the purchases by typing in their credit card number, expiration date, and security code. And if the machine is infected, they just lost their card number. This is Dmitry Golubov from Ukraine, who was also linked to large-scale credit card theft. Uh, Björn Sundin, who was linked to different kind of uh, uh, rogue security product scams. Uh, Matthew Anderson, here from United Kingdom. He, we actually spent quite a while catching this guy because he was actively attacking our sites. He did the first attack, which actually successfully crashed our web- website in 2006. And Vladimir Chachin from Estonia, who was running one of the largest uh, rogue internet operators. And that actually means that criminals started making such a big money with their attacks that they started running their own data centers. They started running their own tech support sites. They started hiring professional coders, doing professional testing for their malware, and even run their own hosting companies, their own registrars, and as in case of Vladimir, their own ISPs. And this is problematic because when we fight problems on the internet, we let's say if you find a website which is used to do something criminal, let's say sell stolen credit card numbers, what we would typically do is that we would contact the hosting company and the internet operator Hello, it's F-Secure. We found a criminal site from your network. Please shut it down. And they would shut it down. In this case, when we would report it, we would report it to Vladimir himself. (laughs) And they would respond, thank you very much for the report. And they would maybe move the server to a different IP address, but continue operations. So our enemies started getting more and more serious, more and more well-equipped. So some of the worms at the time included Sobik, MyDoom, and Bagel. These were uh, all cooperating with uh, the spammers at the time. Uh, so was NetSky. But pretty much at the same time, we started seeing completely new kind of a risk. Because we, we had just went through this massive shift for, shifting from hobbyists to criminals, basically from hobbyists to professionals. But then we saw a case which wasn't really obvious that it was making money. There was no clear monetization mechanism at all. Yet, it was very professionally executed. And the company which initially reported the very first case that we would later categorize as APT cases was a very large defense contractor, a company which was traditionally a typical target for traditional espionage and spying. And they reported a case where they got infected. And a little bit surprisingly, the malware was found from nowhere else. They were the only company in the world. In fact, in that company, only one person had received the malware. And that particular malware wasn't an executable. It was a Word document which was sent by somebody he knew and trusted. And when we spoke with the sender, he didn't actually send it. So it was spoofed in some trusted person's name. And when this document was opened... It would actually drop a backdoor on the system, giving an outsider full access to the network of, of this defense contractor. And we later realized that this is national intelligence agencies doing spying against other countries. This was nine years ago. In this case, the, all the original cases were attributed to the Chinese intelligence. For years and years, the cases were always attributed to the Chinese. But later on, we realized that it's not just the Chinese. There's actually many, many more countries involved. And it basically means that spying and espionage extended or or shifted from the real world to to the online world. And it makes perfect sense for them to do that because spying is collecting information. And information used to be something physical. It used to be something on paper. If you wanted the information, you had to go, go where the paper was to copy it or steal it. And of course, today it's no longer physical. It's now virtual. It's data. It's on our computers. And you don't have to go where it is. You can reach it with attacks like these. And APT attacks are still a problem with us today. A good example on on how these are launched would be the case with Alfred Nobel. Or actually not Alfred Nobel, but the Nobel Peace Prize. Because three years ago, the Nobel Peace Prize was given to Liu Xiaobo a Chinese dissident who famously did not get to pick up his prize in person because he was and still is under house arrest in Beijing. Four days after he was awarded, or it was announced that he's going to get the Peace Prize, this website, NobelPeacePrize.org, was hacked. Hacked by unknown attackers. They didn't modify the site at all. They just breached the site. There was nothing visible that you could see that would have changed on the site. But they did leave 
one line of extra JavaScript on every single page. And that extra line of JavaScript launched an exploit attack against the most common browser at the time, a zero-day attack which would infect every visitor to NobelPeacePrize.org with a backdoor. This was detected two days later by one of the admins. He shut down the site, he put out warnings, he analyzed the attack, he did forensic examination. He did a great job in recovering from this. In fact, he did such a great job that as thanks, he was invited to join the Nobel Peace Prize Gala. Or actually, actually, he got an email inviting him to the Nobel Peace Prize Gala. <laughs> and the email had an invitation file, a PDF file, which is a real invitation to the gala, except this PDF file has an exploit and it drops a backdoor. <laughs> and now the question is, who did this? Who had the motive of doing this? Or even better, which country did this? Which country had the motive of doing this? And these are the kind of cases that at the time led us almost always to point the finger back to the Chinese intelligence. Then we saw the first mobile phone viruses 10 years ago, Kabir infecting Nokia-based devices, which were still popular 10 years ago. <laughs> that is a pity. Then we started finding malware no longer deployed by criminals, but by companies. Sony actually deployed a malicious rootkit on their music CDs in 2005. So if you would buy, for example, a Celine Dion CD and listen it on your computer, it would actually infect your computer with the rootkit. Why? Because that rootkit would prevent you from copying the CD. But it would also leave security vulnerabilities on your computer, which was later exploited by different viruses. But of course, we could claim that if you listen to Celine Dion, it's okay for you to get infected. <laughs> actually, I like Celine Dion. Oh, yeah. <laughs> then we started seeing... Very large-scale email outbreaks like the storm worm and the configure internet worm, which still today remains the single largest botnet we've ever seen. This was five years ago in 2009. Then banking trojans like Zeus and SpyEye became a big headache. These are direct attacks against online banks. They try to steal your money while you are doing online banking. The way they do it is that when you go to an online bank from an infected computer... While you're paying your bills, it will change the account numbers on the fly. So you, the account you see on your screen is not the account where you send the money. That's the basic idea. Which then caused banks to deploy two-factor authentication, for example, text message authentication. So if you send money around, they will, confirm, they will require you to confirm the transaction with a text message. So we started seeing versions of the spy eye trojan, which would infect both your computer and your phone. So when you do banking on your computer and the bank sends you a confirmation text message, the Trojan on your phone will respond to the text message and you still lose the money. So any hurdles we send to these guys, they will just try to, fa try to find, find ways around them. And then we had 2010 and the Stuxnet case. And there clearly is time before Stuxnet and time after Stuxnet. That's how big a deal it was. Stuxnet, which was created and deployed by United States and Israel, targeting the nuclear enrichment systems of Iran. It's the only malware of its kind. It's the only malware we've ever found which targets factory automation systems. It's a multi-million dollar project which was successful in doing what it tried to do. It delayed the Iranian nuclear program by two years or so they say. The Stuxnet was a real game changer for us because one thing that we didn't have was know-how in factory systems. We were good in decoding Windows malware and even Mac malware and even mobile malware, but we knew nothing about factory automation systems and the PLC boxes that run our, um, run our world today. They run every single factory. They run every single food processing plant. The elevators in this building are being run by automation gear like this. And that's exactly what Stuxnet infects. And when we were looking at Stuxnet code in the summer of 2010, we quickly found that it was actually trying to fingerprint only one factory in the world. It was looking for this fingerprint, this unique configuration 
of high-frequency power converters, which can be used to spin centrifuges. If it wouldn't find this right configuration, it wouldn't do anything at all. So even if it would infect the wrong factory or the wrong plant, nothing would happen. So then the question for us became, all right, where in the world is a factory which has a configuration of high-frequency power converters which looks like this? And we started to think that it's probably in Iran. It's probably part of the nuclear system in Iran. But of course, we didn't know if they have a configuration like this. And it's not like you could just go online and Google whether Iranian nuclear power plants have this. Except you sort of could. Because a colleague of mine from Germany investigated this. And during his investigation, he went to the website of the Iranian president. And on his website, there's a collection of photos of him going around and visiting different kind of cities and schools and plants, including a visit to the Natanz nuclear enrichment plant around a year before Stuxnet hit it. And you can see photos of him walking by the centrifuge, but that doesn't really help us in any way. But there's one photo where the president is leaning over and looking at a computer screen. (laughs) And if you actually download this picture, which is, by the way, still today on the website of the president, you can actually zoom into the picture, and you'll see that here is a configuration. If you enhance it, it looks like that. And you'll see that it matches exactly to the code in Stuxnet. So we knew for a fact that the target was the Natanz nuclear enrichment plant, way before it was discovered any other way. This is called open source intelligence. (laughs) So then we're getting to where we are today. Right now, one of the biggest headaches we have is a botnet called Zero Access. Well, it used to be. It's now actually successfully being shut down by analysts around the world. Zero Access was a game changer in the sense of how it was making money because it wasn't stealing money from credit cards or online banks. Instead, it did something related to this guy. This guy is Satoshi Nakamoto, a cryptographer who released a paper in 2009 where he described this complicated thing that he called a blockchain. And by doing these complicated mathematical calculations on this blockchain, you could create a peer-to-peer network, which could be used to create a new currency. And the paper he published was called Bitcoin, a peer-to-peer electronic cash system. This was five years ago. And slowly but surely, Bitcoin started becoming a bigger deal. And it started getting more developers than just Satoshi. And people got interested in this Satoshi guy, because he was really, obviously, a genius. because He solved all the main problems we've always had with cryptocurrencies. But surprisingly, Satoshi wasn't really responding to emails. And then people went looking for him, and they realized that he doesn't exist. There is no Satoshi Nakamoto. So we don't, to this day, we don't know who invented Bitcoin, which is really weird. But Bitcoin has continued growing, despite of the fact that we don't know who invented it. And when Bitcoin was young, it was almost worthless, not exactly worthless, but almost worthless. One Bitcoin was like five cents. And in Bitcoin, you confirm the money transactions uh, within the peer-to-peer network. So other users will confirm your transactions, and you will confirm their transactions. And this is called mining. And if you confirm a lot of transactions, the algorithm, the Bitcoin algorithm, will reward you with free Bitcoins. This is how they inject new currency into the system. So when Bitcoin was young, people would build their absolute cheapest computer they could build, like a 50 euro or 50 pound computer, and leave it running for several months, and it would eventually confirm enough transactions for others that it would get enough free Bitcoins that it would pay itself back. This was when Bitcoin was 5 cents. But today Bitcoin is not 5 cents. Today Bitcoin is $800. And the people who were mining in 2010 and 11 are millionaires, because the value has skyrocketed. Not just with Bitcoin, but also with alternative currencies like Litecoin, Namecoin, and Dogecoin. And today, if you want to mine for Bitcoins, you can actually go and purchase yourself a purpose-built ASIC-based rig, which you can use to do nothing else except mine for Bitcoins, and which will cost you $35,000. And it will pay itself back by mining for cryptocurrencies. And this basically means that there's now a way of converting computing power into cash. And you very quickly realize that if you can convert computing power into cash, it doesn't have to be your own computing power. It can be somebody else's computing power. And we found the first botnets, which were monetizing the infected machines by mining for Litecoin and Bitcoin over a year and a half ago. 
So your machine gets infected, but nothing is stolen from you. It's not stealing your money. It's stealing your processing power and making money that way. Since last year, one of the biggest headaches has been this one. A ransom trojan called CryptoLocker. And ransom trojan means that you get infected and it will lock your system. It will encrypt your files and it will prompt you with a message which gives you 72 hours to pay a ransom to get your files back. And it has encrypted your files with an encryption algorithm which you will not be able to decrypt by yourself. And if you pay them, they actually will send you a program which actually will decrypt your files. So at least they are honest criminals. <laughs> and there's different versions of this, like the Reveton Trojan, which is basically the same idea, except it doesn't claim to be a Trojan. It claims to be that the police has locked your system because they found illegally copied movies or music from your system. And Reveton is nice because it uses GeoIP to figure out where the victim is. So if the victim is in the United States, it's the FBI which has locked your system, and Barack Obama is very angry. <laughs> However, if you get infected in France, the same malware looks like this. <laughs> now it's President Hollande very angry. In Saudi Arabia, it looks like this. And here in UK... <laughs> yes... But to get back to the original topic of silicon plagues, there was a very interesting, almost academic research done by an old-school virus writer called SPTH, which basically is getting very close to silicon plagues. This guy, SPTH, has been around, I don't know, 15 years. He used to be a hobbyist hacker who was writing viruses for fun, and he's still writing viruses for fun. He isn't trying to make money with his attacks. He publishes a small magazine in which he releases interesting new virus ideas, including a virus called SPTH SYN 1.0, which is an attempt to infect biological DNA with a computer virus. So how, how, how do you do that? Well, there is actually academic research into uh, creating synthesized genomes, where you take real genomes, like physical genomes you can touch, and you synthesize them, you can modify them on computers and then resynthesize them back to something physical you can touch and inject it and get modified DNA, which is really weird. But this kind of research is being done by uh, 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 a researcher in, um, in some university, which I don't remember right now. So this virus writer basically wrote code on a computer which will take these synthesized DNA sequences and modify them with code which will replicate itself and is able to replicate further into other DNA. So it is a computer virus which is able to infect DNA. And if I've ever seen a basic evolutionary mistake, well, here's one. Like, do not create a computer virus which is able to infect DNA. Right? That's going to end up bad. <laughs> There's going to be a science fiction movie made out of this, I'm, I'm, I'm sure. But we are getting closer to what we probably should categorize as real silicon viruses or silicon plagues. And to end our trip through the world of silicon plagues and the history of malware history is the biggest news of last year. When Mr. Snowden started leaking information about um, both U.S. and U.K. intelligence agencies tapping to the Internet and reaching over to our private data, it really opened our eyes. It really did. Of course, we had worries about the NSA collecting information about perfectly innocent normal citizens, but we weren't really sure if it's happening for real or not. Now we know for a fact that it's happening. Our worst fears were proven to be true. And these leaks will continue. We've only seen the very beginning of, of what we've seen, of, of, of what, what's going to come out from the Snowden files. The NSA, in particular, splits their operations into two parts. There's targeted espionage, and then there's wholesale blanket surveillance. Targeted espionage is when they have per particular persons or organizations they're interested in, and they use their technical skills to target them. 
And that's understandable. If they're indeed our intelligence agencies, I mean, that's pretty much what they're supposed to do. I can understand why U.S. government wants to listen in to the phone discussions between the Iranian generals, for example, or read uh, email traffic in Syria. That's understandable. But then there's the other side, which is this wholesale blanket surveillance on everybody. Oh, on foreigners, from their point of view, which is only the 96% of the planet. There's 4% Americans, 96% foreigners. They have a legal right to access your communications if you are a foreigner and you make the mistake of using services inside the United States, which we all do all the time. And there they are collecting traffic about completely innocent people, people that they know are innocent. And the only reason it's being done is that it's technically possible. This internet revolution has made it possible to collect traffic and save the traffic. And in these leaks, we've also learned about the elite hacking units, both inside NSA and inside GCHQ. Inside NSA, it's called TAO. Inside GCHQ, it's called NAC. So your intelligence operatives write malware, launch online attacks, and they even launched them against, against allies and friends. One thing we learned from these leaked files is an operation run by your intelligence guys against an internet operator in Belgium. Now, I'm from Finland. We, we Finns, we don't really like the Belgians either. <laughs> but we don't go around hacking their operators. And it really is surprising how far this has gone. The fact is that today, completely democratic Western governments are writing viruses and using them against other democratic Western governments. That's the fact. This is where we are today. That would have sounded like a movie plot 10 years ago. That's where we are. So in many ways, what really happened with the Snowden leaks is that we realize that we no longer are living in a utopia. That's where we thought that we were living in. Because when the web came around 20 years ago, and we started using the web, we very quickly forgot country borders. You know, you're on the web. You, know, you click on links. You go from one side to another. This side is in the United Kingdom. This side is in the United States. This side is in Japan. This side is in Sweden. It doesn't really matter. You just click and go on left and right. No countries, no borders, no distances, no geography. We didn't really care. One world, utopia, maybe naive, but utopia. We had it. We didn't care where all these services were. We didn't care where we were saving our data. It went somewhere in the cloud. We didn't care in which country it was saved or under which jurisdiction it was saved. And that is the thing that we lost. Because now we, again, realize that we never actually had the utopia. We thought we had the utopia, but we didn't. If we did, it's gone. The world is changing. So it's been a pretty wild ride. From the early days, from the happy hackers who were writing viruses on five and quarter inch floppy disks in Lahore, Pakistan, to 2014, where nation states are developing and launching cyber attacks at an ever increasing pace. Thank you very much. Thank you. We all know how important medical staff and medical research are in combating disease. In the cyber security world, professionals are generally invisible and anonymous. But as we've learned, absolutely essential in keeping our personal and our national and our global communities and our data secure. So thank you for being part of those invisible people. I'm sure. We can, many of us, I mean, I find it very concerning that the sources of malware and threats to online security really are no longer 
people in back bedrooms just trying to see what they can do because, you know, it, it, it's interesting. But now it's so much serious criminal intent on financial theft and fraud and the companies and national agencies and governments are doing it as well. The online world is really not at all benign. Next week, we change subjects again. Uh, the Darwin College lectures continue with Professor Angela McLean from the University of Oxford, who will talk about the nature of plagues. But, Miko, you've given us much to ponder. And I suspect that if we weren't unduly concerned before your talk this evening, we certainly are now. <laughs> Maybe at a minimum we'll go home and strengthen our passwords. But thank you very much indeed. Thank you.